Policymakers have been assessing how to tackle the world's vulnerabilities and inequalities during UNCTAD 15, hosted by Barbados. Tonight, Prime Minister of Barbados, the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Ambassador Gail Mathurin, who is Director General of the Office of Trade Negotiations at the CARICOM Secretariat, Isabel Durand, Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD, and Dr. Patrick Jarogi, Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, will discuss the UNCTAD 15 outcomes and priority areas. They will focus on how they will respond to our current global circumstances, how the dialogue and action of policymakers reflect our reality, what steps UNCTAD will take to manage the challenges, and whether the Caribbean's coordinated advocacy at UNCTAD 15 has advanced its priority concerns. I am David Ellis, on behalf of our hosts, the Central Bank of Barbados, welcoming all on television and online to the Caribbean Economic Forum. From inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all is our focus tonight. As we look at our current global circumstances and how UNCTAD 15 can make a difference in bringing about growth, prosperity and development for all. Good evening and warm welcome from the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center in Barbados. You know that even before we were hit by COVID-19, Barbados and other Caribbean countries were already facing a situation where we were up against inequality and vulnerability. But this pandemic has made it even worse. Let's get straight to this, the discussion. And we're going to hear first from the Deputy Secretary General of UNCTAD, Madame Isabel Durand. Madame Durand, we find ourselves in a situation where over the years, there are those who have said that UNCTAD has failed to deliver in the area of narrowing the gap between the rich and the poor. Such persons would ask you, what is there about what has taken place at UNCTAD 15? that would give us greater confidence in believing that we can do better after all of this talk. What do you say to those people? Thank you for the question and good evening, uh, everyone. Well, I'm not sure that UNCTAD was able, even since the beginning, to narrow all the gaps between the rich and the poor. So I think that it was maybe a little bit naive to think, even in 1964, when UNCTAD was created, that it will, uh, that UNCTAD would be able to really uh, f uh, completely delete this gap. So what is happening now, today, after so many years of UNCTAD work, and especially now with the, the multiple crises that we are addressing, that we have to address, the climate crisis, the digital crisis, or the digital gap, but of course the COVID-19, also the crisis of trust, trust in institutions, trust in national but also supranational institutions, there is a momentum was something which something has to change. And it's true that even if the crisis, the, the financial crisis of 2008-2009 was not really well addressed and the, the answer which was given to this crisis was not appropriated and we, we know how we are in the situation for debt and debtness but also all the questions of financing for development are not solved and the COVID-19 has just exacerbated all what existed before. So I'm, I'm not naive, but I think that frankly at this moment, if something is not changing really deeply now, when? I think that we are equipped to do the things. And I, I will explain why. I think that because of a, a lot of reasons, the, the situation and the, the multiple crises push us to really do something. And some ideas, seeds that uh, UNCTAD planted in the past, it was not here enough. I think that today a lot of ideas, proposals of UNCTAD are not discussed in IMF, in different places, where they feel that something that UNCTAD said before is now totally on the table. It doesn't mean that, of course, the solution will be adopted as soon, but I think that there is a real momentum for not only for UNCTAD, but for all the players, the stakeholders. Another reason 
It's that because Barbados is with us. And frankly, I don't say that because I'm here in Bridgetown or because Madame Motley is in front of me. But it's true that having a developing countries, especially a small island countries, which invite, host this conference, with the strength, the strength and the, the courage to do it in the circumstances that we know, I think that it's something which reveals to the rest of the world that the voice of the South is a strong voice, not only a voice to claim about we would like to have donors to help us or to assist us, that's the past. It's how we can really build something which is solid, robust enough, which is really adapted to the crisis that we are facing, especially, of course, the climate crisis, because that's a crisis for all of us. And I think that finally, a lot of people, and even the simple people here in Barbados uh, and everywhere in, the, everywhere in the world, are feeling that because of the COVID and the climate cri crisis, no solution is possible on local, national level. We will never win alone or separately. And everybody feels that it's true, even if, of course, those who are defending the statu quo or defending their interest will say, no, no, we have to solve that at all level. But I think that every citizen can feel that the, the solution will be a global solution. There is no other, voice, no other ways to do that. And I think that the momentum, the momentum is key. Does that mean that UNCTAD will succeed? Uh, maybe not at all, at all for all the issues that we, that, we, that we are committed to. But I think that frankly, something can be done now because there is a momentum which is key. And what we did this last three, four days, and also the months before, it's creates, try to create dialogue, consensus, at least a consensus on the ideas, only on the ideas. But that's the beginning. If we have a real consensus on the discussion that you can listen to the others. And I just said, we, 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 we informally discussed on the fact that it's difficult to have a conference with 195 uh, uh, member states, the donors and the beneficiaries, the north and the south. I don't like this really uh, way to present the things because it's more complex. And I think that we are, if we are able to really bridge between the north and the south, bridge between the rich and the poor, bridge between the polar polarized world. Some would like to continue a very polarized world because they are the winners of that, because they can say, okay, that's not us, that's the other. I think that building something, listening, trying to, to open and to, and to, to uh, feed the dialogue is something that UNCTAD can do. And we will have the support of Barbados the next years, I'm sure in order not to succeed on all, but I think that to succeed on some things and giving good signals for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, let's come to you, Dr. Jirogi, and look at the fact that we depend so heavily on the countries that are more developed to assist us in the quest of narrowing the gap. What are you seeing, what are you sensing as it relates to getting their cooperation? Thank you, David, and uh, first, uh, good evening to everybody, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Prime Minister, for the very, let's say, the welcome and the hospitable, um, yeah, hospitality uh, to our delegation. Thank you very much. And in terms of the question, there is actually a lot that has been done recently in terms of acknowledging um, the, the problems as we have them. And acknowledging first that uh, we need to deal with the post-COVID situation. Um, from this perspective, uh, we are not out of the woods, um, and this is particularly in the global south, and uh, we need the vaccines, and there has to be some uh, vaccine equity in this regard. That is not a problem that can be done um, in this old way, as you mentioned. So that's one. The other one, of course, is the issue of uh, opportunities for our growing population. And uh, we have to acknowledge that looking forward, um, the next, say, to 2050, actually the vast amount of, uh, let's say, the workforce will be in Africa. That's really where the workforce is. 25% of, of the workforce in the world will be in Africa. So we need to create 
jobs that are meaningful for them. That means that we cannot depend on the old sort of directions of trade and old trading patterns to, to create those jobs. And then finally, the issue of climate. Climate change is a fundamental issue for all of us. And this is something that, is, that affects us deeply, and I think um, the Prime Minister has really emphasized this issue that we in the South are probably the ones that are getting the, the, the biggest pain, the blunt of uh, climate change, even though we are the ones that are producing the least of the greenhouse gases, etc. So the point here is that all these three questions cannot be dealt in the same old, same way, um, where we depend a lot more on trade of, uh, let's say, merchandise trade with the North, right? So we need to establish other trading patterns and indeed helping each other in the global south. It isn't just about trade. It's also about, um, for instance, not just trading goods, but actually trading services, for instance, and also acknowledging our, our cultural and, should we say, our own um, identity as people, etc. So that is really the, the whole point in terms of uh, bringing ourselves together in the South, um, as opposed to just maintaining patterns of trade, patterns of, uh, let's say, even communication for that matter, that have been established over the last 50 years. To what extent would you say that the history of these trading blocks encourages people to believe that this is the direction in which we should go, especially when you take into consideration Britain and Brexit? I think history will, well, teaches us a lot of things. Uh, one of which is that uh, there has to come a moment when, uh, let's say, not, well, a lot happens in a very short period of time. And I think there's that quote by Lenin, um, you know, a long time, nothing is happening, but then over a very short period, a lot happens. So I think the point here is it's, there will be, and it, this is the moment, this is the moment when I think a lot will happen because there, there's alignment amongst our leaders, there's also clarity about the problem, and uh, we cannot continue just providing the same answers as before. You know, for instance, the issue of uh, jobs, as I mentioned, Africa today generates only about 3.7 million jobs a year, even though actually we need about 10 to 12 uh, million jobs every year to accommodate the people that are coming in. So that is clearly something that cannot be sustained. The same thing with uh, climate change. Um, so I think the point here is it is now very clear to everybody that the old patterns, the old ways of looking at things have, brought, have come to the end of their life. And there has to be something else that actually brings us together. And I think the UNCTAD conversations have been very good in this regard. But there has been others. And I think COVID also, the concerns about vaccine inequity, etc., has brought us together. So there are many other things that have happened very soon or in a very short period of time. And that's why we are much more confident that a lot will happen in a short period of time. Let me come next to Ambassador Mathurin. And uh, Ambassador, you have indicated that CARICOM has for the past year or so been involved in a process of discussion with UNCTAD leading up to this UNCTAD 15. And I'd, I'd like you to identify for us what CARICOM has seen as the the areas of interest, the, the significant ones, that call for this kind of cooperation. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Um, and let me just indicate that it's a great pleasure to be participating in this panel. Uh, before getting into this question, uh, I just, I must say that CARICOM, certainly the CARICOM Secretary, is particularly proud that one of our member states so successfully hosted in CAD 15, um, despite the constraints particularly brought on by the 
COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we think it is an extremely successful meeting and we in the Secretary are particularly proud of Barbados. Congratulations, congratulations to the government and the Barbados. Um, UNCAD 15, from a CARICOM perspective, clearly presents an opportunity for the region to uh, put forward in a very strong and coordinated way concerns uh, of small island development countries, of, of low lying uh, countries, which of course make up the membership of CARICOM. And so, um, Last year, relevant councils of CARICOM uh, mandated the Secretariat and the Member States to um, sit down and outline particular issues of interest to CARICOM, which we would bring into the OSAC 15 process. Um, I should also add that the first time, I believe, um, a SIDS declaration was presented to an UNCAD conference. And I would just look at some of the issues that that declaration raised because they are totally at even with the concerns of CARICOM in particular. Um, there were issues related to the access to uh, concessional financing is an issue which the region has been focusing on for a very long time. We believe that there are inadequate criteria to determine the eligibility of concessional financing, particularly from the international financial institutions. I would note that UNCAD has some time on the issue of vulnerability indices, which fully reflect the vulnerability of, of countries such as ours wanted to see this conference adopt uh, a, a strong decision continuing and in fact speeding up that work. Of course there was the issue of climate change and the ability of SIDS to transition um, from acute vulnerability to sustainable levels of prosperity. And of course we recognize that this new advances in technical financial institutional capacity to adapt to the environmental shocks of the global climate, global climate change. Indeed, we note that the, um, the spirit of spikes down political declaration which was adopted this morning uh, speaks to climate crisis. We in Caribbean know well about that. And therefore, we wanted to see that continue and strengthen its work in supporting the uh, at the implementation of ISIS of climate-friendly truth and production strategies. There were also, there were also concerns in relation to the high and unsustainable debt burden of SIDS, um, which seeded the COVID-19 pandemic, but in fact has been exacerbated by the pandemic. And um, therefore, we wanted to see uh, work and buy, buy back new and debt issues with a view to trying to build consensus on um, application of, sorry, provision of additional financing um, for all countries such as ours, both with the pandemic um, and with the climate change demands. These were some of the very important issues that the uh, CARICOM and the SITS based in the quotations leading up to the outcome document. And I think we're very pleased to know that the um, Barbados breakdown cover reflects, we think, in a very uh, constructive way uh, the issues of concern to the region as well as uh, the directions back to the work program of UNCAD going forward over the next four years. So we are generally very, very pleased with the outcome and we look forward to seeing uh, the work develop, continue and lead to results. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ambassador Mathurin. Now to you, Prime Minister uh, Motley. 
What would you identify as the successes of this conference? I think that we were able to get, as I said, give and take, and to be able to successfully conclude the Bridgetown Covenant and the spirit of Spitestown, which is a political declaration. That that could happen with a number of countries engaged in the process, as you heard from Madame Durand, is a significant achievement. But as you also heard from um, Patrick, we are at a stage where the issues that confront the world are so clear that you would have to be a blind man on a trotting horse to avoid them. And the issue now is not so much what are the issues, but what will be the response of the world. And to that extent, I think that we all recognize that the only thing that's missing is the political will that will lead to concrete action and results um, on the part of all of us. I suspect that the political will is there for the majority of the people on the earth. We all know that in 12 to 13 years time, that it is likely, given the, end, the nationally determined contributions being advanced by countries across the world, that we will exceed, regrettably, the 1.5 degrees. I'm hoping that we can be proven wrong at Glasgow, but we're not seeing evidence of it thus far. As a result of that, we then have to go to the next best card. How do we get the funds to deal with adaptation? Because we have to adapt to living in this new world. It sounds funny, but the reality is, think of where you were 13 years ago, David. Can I remember? Well, I can help you remember, because 13 years ago, it was 2008, and Barbados bought a new government in 2008, and you were very much on the front line of being able to ensure. But you will remember that, Prime Minister. I wasn't remembering it for the reasons that you think. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is, I'm saying that that's how close 13 years is from where we are today. So that when you combine that fact, you then realize that you don't have much time to spend and to build the infrastructure necessary to adapt to the changes that will come as a result of, of the 1.5 degrees being exceeded. But we need that po powerful minority to support us. That's the point. And that's why I say that the political will is, has to be there. Now, we've seen some movement, but not sufficient. And that's why you hear me using the phrase, mind the gap. So the American government, President Biden at the UN General Assembly, did come and increase America's contribution. But really and truly, what they're doing is still not sufficient. And if you were to look at it proportionally, they're still short of what they could be doing and should be doing as a country. Similarly, we have seen the Chinese advance and say, look, we will not finance any new coal power stations outside of, of um, China. But is that enough? No. So what we really need from them is to say that there will be no net increase in coal production, even if they build new plants in China, that they're going to take old plants out of production. Because without that, you're going to get a peak three, four, five years from now, when the world really can't take a further peak in respect of coal. So these things are going to have serious implications. Look, even before we came here tonight, we had thunderstorms this evening. We've gotten into this habit now of um, almost convection rain, heavy, intense rain and thunderstorms in the afternoon in a way that I would have associated previously with Jamaica or Miami. Now you're getting it here in Barbados. So there's no doubt in our mind that the crisis is real. And that's why we would have fought even just for the word crisis in our declaration, because there's still some countries in the world who want to refer to it as just climate change. But we know that we are in the middle of a crisis as we speak. Now, the other real problem is this. It's one thing to say that we want money for adaptation. And the UN Secretary General has been in the vanguard, along with small island developing states, in saying that 50% of the money, that of the 100 billion, should be used to adapt. Because that's what we really need to do to prepare ourselves for the worst. Problem is that most of the small island developing states have high debt ratios already so that they don't have the fiscal space to easily absorb additional debt. And that's why we're saying that how that money is delivered, some of it is going to have to be grant money. And think about it. If I come at you, I dirty up your property, you then are forced to spend the money to clean it up. And the money that you're spending to clean it up is not available anymore to pay for a mortgage or to buy food. 
So you have been disadvantaged by my actions. And we've said that it is immoral and it is unjust. And that we need, therefore, persons to stand responsibility for what they're doing. But at the same time, from a very practical perspective, most small island developing states do not have the fiscal space to be able to mount the battles, even in adaptation, without there being a review of either the debt to GDP anchor, and Ryan can speak more to that, from 60%, which is unsustainable for us, or alternatively, without some of it being pure grant resources, in which case it will not count for that. The big question to, to you and the other panelists, <coughs> though, is after this what? You come to Barbados, we have this virtual conference, we come up with all of these declarations, and where do we go from here? Uh, Madame Doron, you want to take that? Yes, because uh, after what? It starts tomorrow. A lot of things are starting tomorrow. And uh, not only in Barbados, we will have the meeting of the IMF in the fall. We will have the ministerial conference of WTO in November, discussing all the issues on fisheries and a lot of issues related to trade and environment. When the, the, uh, the WTO was created in 1995, climate issue or environmental issue was not perceived as important as it is today. So I think that reforms in the WTO is very important. And I, I come back to what you what said. Uh, uh, um, sorry, I don't remember your name. Patrick Jerogi. Yes, Patrick. So because it's true that trade also has to change completely related to the problem of environment and climate. Thirdly, we will have the COP, of course, the COP in December, of our Nove uh, November. And this COP has also to discuss the question of the fund, the, the famous uh, 100 million uh, uh, US dollar, uh, and uh, the money for adaptation, but also how we will try, or they will try in the COP to really uh, uh, go a little bit further. You remember that the past COP was a big failure. Nothing happened. So, so the COP uh, the, of last year was, of course, cancelled because of uh, COVID-19. But the COP before it was completely without any results. So I think that now every member states, every head of states, every minister of environment or climate are really uh, 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 on, on the, the wall. And they have to move. And they, they, they will move. I'm sure that they have to move. So there was something which that's the, the very short-term issues, short-term decision. In addition to that, UNCTAD was, uh, uh, has to really continue to uh, put on the table ideas, proposals, for instance, on the reallocation of the, the famous uh, 650 billion uh, of the, the, the special drawing rights. It's not normal that it could go to the countries which don't need this money. So how we organize coalition in order to really reallocate this money to for adaptation or all the needs that the COVID-19 demonstrated. So yes, there was a lot of things starting now. It's not a question to wait, I don't know what. Uh, it's really a, a process that we, are, we will continue to, to, to realize in coalition with others. UNCTAD is not uh, an island in, in the world or in the lake in Geneva. We are really with the rest of the international community, with all the member states, with all what is happening around us and where decisions are taken. UNCTAD is not a rule-making organization. We are there to push, to, to really uh, give the voice of the South. That's, that's our mandate. And this voice will be heard, I, I can ensure you. Dr. Jorogi, uh the panel speaks very positively, but in a large group like this, there are those who have alternative views. The pessimists, what are they telling you? Um, I don't know about the pessimists because uh, as, uh, as is clear, the problems are very clear, right? So the pessimists, I think, will probably be more concerned about costs. Um, can we do it? cheaper and that is a standard problem if we all agree on the problem but you know maybe this is too much um, or for that matter um, are we doing the modeling well enough um, the 13 years that the prime minister mentioned well maybe it is 20 i mean there are all those sort of naysayers in a sense but i i don't think we have the luxury to listen to those to the pessimists but I wanted to add one thing, which is um, the, the, the sort of considerations that, uh, um, that the DSG and indeed also the Prime Minister mentioned, 
there's a lot of work that is being done in another area, and this is in the financial sector. And the financial sector is a big cog in this whole process. So think about the, um, the, the, the uh, financing of various projects, for instance. And the, there has to be greater consideration given to things that relate to the environment, to sustainability, etc. Now, it's true at this moment there's that label ESG, but it has to go beyond that to the point where, in our view, all financing in the future need to be, uh, needs to be green, you know, completely green. Um, not just more or less green, but completely green as, as, uh, as one would expect. That is one thing that I think is extremely important. And there, there's an entire sort of uh, work stream in the private sector and indeed with us in the central banks um, because the banks are important in this process. And uh, one of the things, for instance, relates to the, uh, the financial disclosures that uh, various institutions and indeed the banks themselves uh, um, are required uh, or would be required um, to disclose in the in the various uh, places. So I, I just wanted to add this thing of uh, the financial sector is very important in making sure that uh, those outcomes are actually um, they actually come to pass. Thank you. When we come back, we are going to hear the voices of some of the region's youth. We'll be right back. It salutes unsung heroes who fashioned a modern society and economy and built an institution of which every Barbadian can be proud. Perfect for economists, business people, politicians, and anyone who wants to learn more about the Central Bank of Barbados and how its staff serves you and contributes to our economic and financial development. Download your free copy today. Financial Stability Report checks the health of Barbados's financial system and is published by the Central Bank of Barbados and the Financial Services Commission. The regulators of our domestic financial institutions like banks, credit unions, insurance companies and pension funds. Let me also introduce Minister in the Ministry of Finance in Barbados, Mr. Ryan Strawn. Uh, Mr. Strawn, for you, what stands out as matters of significance at this UNCTAD 15 conference? Good evening, David. Um, good evening to your listeners. Uh, let me start by saying that I certainly welcome your, your, your introduction with respect to the youth of this country and the region. Because some 27 years ago, I participated as a student um, in what was then called the Barbados Program of Action 
that was held here right here in Barbados to raise the issues that impact the vulnerabilities for small and developing states. And as a young person then, and I still regard myself as a young person now, <laughs> I think I have an opportunity obviously to, to help shape from a, not just from a policy perspective, but from an implementation perspective in terms of how do we create um, a coalition of the willing with respect to be able to solve some of these very serious challenges that are facing not just young people in the Caribbean, but certainly young people globally. And, and, and I welcome the remarks from the Governor of the Bank of Kenya because this government has been actively engaged in making things happen to create opportunities for young people, but equally in helping to solve and, um, some of the problems that we are facing. And I believe that the conference really, notwithstanding that it was held virtually, really opens the minds of young people as to what is possible you, with the utilization of technologies to be able to help solve problems. And I think that one of the things, one of the very, very key things that young people must take away from this conference isn't just that it is a talk shop, but it allows us to connect virtually and in real time, any time, any part of the world, persons, any part of the world who may help solve those problems. Now, 27 years ago, we did not have the kinds of technologies that we had today. And I think it's important for every young person in the region to recognize that they have an opportunity to help solve problems, not just in their geographic space, but to help work with other young people across the world to help solve other problems as well. And therefore, to the extent that we can create a space where not just dialogue, but action, and I'm, I welcome certainly the delegation from Kenya, and we've been actively engaging in opening up real opportunities for investment, which can help support trade, and certainly the extent to which we can help foster much more concrete relations and, and, and plans of action that will allow countries across the South to help solve some of those problems. And the extent to which, yes, we do need partners globally to be able to help solve some of the big problems. But I think that in this 21st century, we have it within us, certainly across the South, to do much more active collaboration to help solve problems, but equally to help um, lift a number of our um, citizens, certainly out of poverty, create opportunities for young people and I'm very excited that this is one of those areas that I believe very strongly the conference will demonstrate to all young people across the world that we can solve these problems and we can solve them together. Thank you but it, it brings us to the concept of what is called digital colonialism and Prime Minister uh, Motley you have made the point that the bulk of trade today is being done not through ports but through the internet and that a small group of people are reaping the benefits. And there are those who will ask you um, whether UNCTAD 15 can influence such change. How optimistic are you about it? And why are you so optimistic? Well, let's put it this way. I believe that any task you take on in life, you have to be optimistic about it. So I start from that perspective. But secondly, the truth is that we have seen with the consolidation of wealth and the consolidation of power and information, an effective privatization of trade because the majority of trade today now is not through the airport or the seaport, as you said, but really through the internet port. When you think of it, 90% of what people are doing now, they're going on Amazon, they're going on Alibaba, they're going on all of these sites to buy. And therefore, the absence of a framework and a set of rules to be able to govern how that is going to function, as well as what are the rules in terms of the extent of the price that they purchase from people, what they take as a percentage in your own profession. Right now we have a major, major problem that the region is going to have to face because a large percentage of the advertising revenue with respect to digital advertising is not in fact coming to the local media. Now that has serious implications also for the stability of our democracy. So that's why I smiled, even though you can't see it, when you talked about digital colonialism. And in truth and in fact, in the other area which you're involved in now, one of the biggest reasons for vaccine hesitancy has come as a result of fake news. And the world has learned that 65%, two thirds of all of the information 
from anti-vaxxers was being generated by 12 people. So when we talk about the private oligopoly that are literally controlling this information and movement, we saw it and in fact today in the Creative Industries report, um, Dr. Annalie Bab and Mr. Adrian Green reported that their session, their forum, were extremely concerned and that which they spoke about came to pass on Monday when Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, all of them went down. So we believe that, look, we have to pause. I don't know anything about algorithms sufficiently, but I do know that how you program algorithms can determine what comes at the top and what never comes to be seen at all. And therefore, can there be fair trade for persons who are producing goods and who have no access to the kinds of power to influence what goods come to the top and what goods stay at the bottom. I think that this is a major issue. I think that we're now started. That's why on Monday and today I said the journey now begins. And I certainly, as President of UNCTAD, will work with Madam um, Durand and also Secretary General Greenspan and their whole group, conscious that, as I said, UNCTAD has been that body that has influenced other institutions by the great technical work that it has done and by being able to bring clarity a number of issues for others to make decisions. The world needs to make a decision on this issue. And that's without prejudice to my other concern, that one, that what we read and have, that they have to be accountable. And two, that we need to also understand that there's something fundamentally wrong about five companies having a market capitalization of 9.3 trillion and school children don't have access to affordable tablets to help them learn in the middle of a pandemic. That brings us now to, to you, um, Madam uh, Durand. How do you see the way forward in this regard? Yes, I, I would like to add that the management of this big issue on data, because big data is really the engine of all this system that the Prime Minister described. And um, the, the way to manage or to govern data today, it's globally in the US through the private sector, in China by the state, and in the European Union by privacy and protection or individual protection of, uh, of the persons, of the, the rights of the person. That's not a way to work. That's three different ways to govern data. And it's why we have to work on that because data is really the way to, to have at the end not only fake news and all those problems, but also potential benefits. And we know that 90% of the benefit of all the biggest uh, GAFA today are in China and in the US. 10% of the economic benefit of the digital economy is for the rest of the world, all the rest of the world. So some things have changed. And UNCTAD is providing a lot of analysis, research, but also research which are related to the situation also of the developing countries. What's happened, I don't know, in Benin, in, in, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, in Africa, and I don't speak about Kenya because Kenya is really started with this question of the mobile money, fantastically something which is really helpful for a lot of people in Africa. But I think that what we are doing is really to help the countries to understand the business model of data, because it's not the same model as the normal or the traditional economy. And it's why it's important that developing countries I mean, all governments, civil society, stakeholders, private sector could understand how it works in order not only to become the client of the biggest, but to become also actor players and trying to have benefit for development through digital economy. It's through big data, it's through internet of things, it's through blockchain, it's not only just internet, it's really all the new technologies and maybe in two or three years, so some things, it's so fulgurant, the evolution of those technologies. So we, for us in UNCTAD, that's a new, well, relatively new uh, uh, way to work on all those digital issues to serve or to, to really promote development, not only to promote benefit, but promote benefit for development. So that's something, sometimes a lot of developing countries are not really enough equipped to go to discuss in the WTO how to organize the taxation of the, the, the transaction. Uh, they are not enough equipped in order to really participate to the strong regulation, need of regulation. And so they need also to receive material uh, to discuss that. And that's also one of the mandate or the role of FUNCTAT to help to that in order to uh, have finally a regulation uh, which is 
ethic enough and which is, of course, uh, equitable enough. Dr. Jirogi seems anxious to weigh in on this. I think, uh, first and foremost, there are, significant, there's a, there are risks and benefits. And uh, the, the risks have been articulated quite well. And those are things that are actually unfortunately, um, they are not just in the thinking part, they are actually a reality, as has been explained. But I think what is also important is that there is also other trends, meaning other currents, where, for instance, as uh, the DSG has mentioned, some of the, let's say, the countries in the south uh, are coming together and actually dealing, understanding where the problem really is. For instance, um, I, I was part of, uh, Kenya was actually, has been working with um, the Swiss government uh, precisely on how to deal with the big techs. And this is before um, the problems, um, or, or rather the large, the five large uh, tech companies were, you know, had their presentation at the Senate in the US, etc. And we have been pushing that forward, obviously, quietly, but I think it has, there has been significant sort of agreement. Um, basically, uh, the bottom line with that is that the, the the South and the, the poorer countries, the low-income countries, need to be at the table during the discussion of uh, big tech. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, it is our information, our data that will be used um, for specific purposes like the one you explained in terms of um, AI, etc. That's one big thing. But on the other hand, there's also the, we need to also be clear that there are a lot of benefits. And uh, so even as there are risks, we need to also watch on the benefits. And I think uh, there has been a lot of push in terms of financial inclusion in the recent years in Africa, um, mainly driven by technology, in, you know, as, as you've mentioned. And yes, a lot of that has been mobile money, but it isn't just mobile money. But I think the point here is that we are now getting sort of ecosystems that can uh, push us even further. At the end of the day, the objective is democratization of financial services. That's really what it is. And through financial services, access uh, to commodities, etc. So I think from our perspective, we do need to, um, let's say, watch on the risks, but at the same time push on the benefits so that we can quickly get um, our young people provide them with the opportunities that the minister talked about, because um, in the future, jobs will have to be, if we were thinking meaningful jobs, they have to be connected somehow with these new technologies that are coming through. Prime Minister uh, of Barbados, um, the, the question is, where do we go from here with these concerns? After UNCTAD, where else can we go with them? Well, I mean, as I keep saying that this is a relay race um, and you can view it however you want but we have to keep going to a different leg each time and I think um, Madam Durand indicated the other meetings that we have in between we also have the opportunity for bilateral engagement next week I go to the United States of America not just for the World Bank IMF meetings and to chair the development committee but I also hope to have a series of bilateral meetings as well and we will continue to do that because we need to be able to see the needle move, particularly in the interest of small nations. Um, our concern is not just that people act in a manner that is altruistic. We're saying that you're acting in a manner that helps you. Because at the end of the day, if you see in the future failed societies or failed states, then you're going to have climate migration, then you're going to have hemispheric insecurity. Um, I think that we've... We've seen other examples of that throughout the world. And for the first time again, look, there was a figure today that I quoted that is so staggering. Apart from the 117 million people that have gone back into poverty, according to the ILO last year, it is estimated that 73% of the young people are unemployed as a result of the pandemic. That's three in every four, David. 
And those are the very same people that we need to be building out. The governor said just now that in Africa, instead of being able to meet the demand of 10 to 12 million jobs a year, they're barely coming in at 3.7. That's one third. Unless we get this right, we're going to have difficulties with respect to insecurity. Now, by the same token, if we get it right, then we can start to build a solid foundation that gives people opportunity. And what we want, it is in companies' interest to maximize profits, but it is in government's interest and obligation to ensure that there's fairness and equity. And all we're saying is, by all means, grow, by all means, earn, by all means, make profits, but let us make sure that when you do it, that across the board it is fair and that it is not as a result of the exploitation of people who are vulnerable. And that's why we talk about inequality, vulnerability, and prosperity, because we see those two as the basis of where people are now, but we need to be able to grow and add value, add value, add value, so that we can begin to take back those people who have fallen into poverty back out. But I also want us to step back too, and, and be students of history. All throughout history, we've had moments like this where we face great, great calamity, either through public health, for public health reasons, or wars. And in effect, we have become accustomed in the last 50, 60 years to a world that has been relatively stable, last 70 years even. Um, there have been some wars, but the wars have been isolated. There have been, there was a the concern with the HIV AIDS pandemic, but that even was not across the board because of how you contracted it. I believe that we have to recognize that we have literally to dig deep and to be resilient and to be creative in order to meet these challenges. The one that is really bothersome is the climate because that is the one that is in a sense even outside of our control unless we do the things that we need to do right now. The others are hard, difficult, but they are exactly what our forefathers would have gone through at some point in time. So I believe that the use of history and the recognition that we're not asking you to act in your, as, a, as a charitable act, but to act in your own self-interest will eventually see the needle move. The problem is how many people will fall and how many countries will fall when that happens. So I am confident that the world will eventually do the right thing. But the question is, who will fall before they do it? But you know, it's interesting to hear you speak so passionately about it. Uh, there are many who will say that prior to your coming on the regional stage, there was an absence of uh, that kind of zeal and energy. And after you, what? How well, do you see I, it? I don't agree. I mean, I listened to President Ali from Guyana. And he, on this very stage, was as strong and continues to be. Um, he's been very, very strong on these issues. I think that there are a number of persons. I think all of us do it in their own way. Um, and, and all of us are effective in our own way. I've seen Grenada under Prime Minister Keith Mitchell. They were the first ones to issue the natural disaster clauses, which we now have also issued. It's just that theirs was at a much smaller value than ours. We're going to come back. Yep. We're going to come back. Um, we're looking at from inequality and vulnerability to prosperity for all. And we'll be right back. Although we're called a bank, the Central Bank of Barbados is not like other banks. We are a statutory body and we work alongside government to safeguard the Barbados dollar's exchange rate with the US dollar. We also work with the Financial Services Commission to monitor the entire financial system. So even though you cannot get a loan or open an account with us, we are very important and are truly committed to Barbados's continued economic growth and financial stability. Each summer, the 
Central Bank of Barbados offers a student a chance to help change the world through a scholarship to attend the Caribbean Science Foundation's student program for innovation in science and engineering. It's designed for 16 and 17 year olds gifted in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and is a replica of the well-known MITES program at MIT. We're nurturing young, inquisitive minds who could transform our economy, our region, and our world. CBB 101, economics about you and me. CBB 101, economics about you and me. Understand your economy. How we live, how we eat, how we spending, that is all our week. Protecting and safeguarding our savings, our stability, maintaining our dollar you see. That is all our we come on and see. CBB 101, economics about you and me. CBB 101, economics about you and me. Join the Governor of the Central Bank of Barbados in January, May, August and October as he explains the country's economic performance, reveals economic policy direction, answers your questions live online and brings clarity to how the economy works and what to expect. The Central Bank of Barbados presents the Barbados Quarterly Economic Review. If you miss the What are some of the views of young people in the region? Let's hear some of those views. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Fidel and I'm from the Commonwealth of Dominica. I'd like to call on governments and young people to collectively reimagine a financial system that better suits the needs of a reimagined and modern workforce. My name is David Johnson. I'm a proud citizen of Barbados and the founder of a mental health advocacy group called Let's Unpack It. Out of the conversations at the UNCTAD 15 Youth Forum, it is abundantly clear that as a world we must place more emphasis on mental health. At present, too few countries have a comprehensive mental health policy, and governments allocate a mere 2% of their healthcare budgets to mental health. In a world where 1 in 4 people will have to cope with a mental illness in their lifetime, and poor and young people are disproportionately affected by mental illness, a continued apathetic approach is simply insufficient. Healthier citizens are more productive citizens, so if we are indeed development driven, we must fund efforts to increase mental health awareness, develop mental health policy, and facilitate access to quality care for all. My name is Ashley Brennan, and I am from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the founder of Feminine Caribbean and post UNCTAD, I am really hoping that governments across the world recognize that in order to have sustainable development, that there is gender justice. And so, that they will commit to a complete overhaul of all of the social systems that are centering gender inequality and ensure that there is a gender transformative approach that ensures that people have access to the rights, to the services, to the education and opportunities that they deserve. Hello, my name is Java Sili, CARICOM Youth Ambassador to Barbados, and to the leaders of UNCTAD, I want to see the development of Caribbean creative industries with trade digitization. I want to see policy efforts towards legitimizing and certifying the artistic professionals within the nations of the Caribbean and the African continent to allow them to profit from their phenomenal and brilliant creative work. I want to see more value attributed to the creative economies which were held back by lack of consideration and improper market evaluation. Lastly, I just want to see the needle move. In the words of PM Motley at her most recent UNGA speech, because a world in which the needle hasn't moved is a world in which my generation can no longer afford to survive. Please hear these words and accept my challenge. The views of some of the region's youth, and I'll come to Ambassador Mathurin for her reaction to what has been said there, a call for a financial system that meets the needs of a modern workforce, a comprehensive mental health policy, saying that too little money is allocated to mental health, 
a call for greater gender equality and for Caribbean creative industries with trade digitization. Your thoughts, Ambassador Mathurin? Uh, thank you. I would just note that the region as we speak is finalizing a new five-year um, um, This is driven by the CARICOM Secretariat and the other CARICOM institutions in the region. And the issues which uh, our young people have just identified are all featuring as priorities in that um, plan. Indeed, I said five years, it's actually going to be a 10 year strategic plan. Um, but let, let, me, let me focus on the history of the creative industries. Um, there, is, there is focus that's going to be placed on that. I think there is need for. Um, for standards and recognition um, in order to, to facilitate the growth of those industries. They're also, we are also looking at opportunities in our trade agreements to uh, promote our creative um, industries. Uh, in that context, I would note that the economic partnership agreements, both with the European Union and uh, more lately with the United Kingdom, uh, have very uh, extensive provisions for the export of our creative industries. Um, we need to do more work in promoting those in, in those, those sectors. Um, the issue of gender uh, inequality is also a major issue that is going to be, that, that will be highlighted in our strategic plan. Um, already there is, it's, it's not a new issue, but it does take on added um, urgency particularly in light of the fallout from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's very interesting that um, the issue of mental health has been mentioned. Um, certainly many of the consultations um, that some of us in the Secretariat were able to participate in, in the development of this strategic plan, uh, when we met with the youth groups, the issue of mental health featured, uh, featured very strongly, and I should note that this was before the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, and so clearly this is an issue uh, in, in, in looking at the health situation in the region that we have to pay more attention to, and this is going to be one of the issues that will feature in the strategic plan. And finally, the financial system, um, this is, this is something that I think we, we need to, as a region, encourage in particular our central banks. I think the ECCP uh, is already doing work uh, in, in that direction and one or two of the nas national central banks. And so this is, this is an, these, are, these are all areas which in one way or the other are being addressed or will be addressed by regional uh, plans of action. Um, uh, and 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 uh, supported by by government rollout. I just want to go back to the creative industries um, issue because if I recall correctly, I think one of the first um, the first set of uh, discussions coming out of UNTAD 15 will relate to the development of the need there is there is a uh, support for this to be found in the um in the in the bridgestone covenant um and and hopefully UNCTAD will be able to support work in this area as we try to to build further on our uh, development of our creative industries Thank you very much ambassador Mathurin. um there are many people in the region though when we talk about the youth and looking towards the future, who feel that there is a, a deep disconnect between what is being advanced for young people and what young people are calling for. Because you've got these different groups of young people, different demographics. Uh, how do you see this, Prime Minister? How do you see this, um, Minister Strawn? You spoke earlier about your days as, as a youth. And um, how do you see the divide now? Well. David, I think it's important for 
not just young people, but certainly with the idea of development, to recognize that the world is a disruptive place. And certainly in my short time, I've seen quite a bit of, of, of churn um, in my 45 years. Now, I say to young people that we must position ourselves to be able to respond to any challenge that may arise um, going forward. And therefore, the opportunities that in terms of building um, strategic alliances and relationships globally is going to be important to help us to respond. And therefore, whether it is the way that financial intermediation is done, because whether we like it or not, we have to come to a realization that even the way that banking <laughs> may be done in the future will change. The way that, that Facebook, you, you, you refer to Prime Minister Facebook and these types of things, did not exist 10 years ago. But the reality is that 10 years ago, there were other technologies which we were using for our communication, which were long gone. And therefore, as we move forward, I think the, the notion that the world may be a stable place, I think we must disavow ourselves because at the end of the day, progress means that there's change. Now, there's positive change, there's negative change, but I think we have to recognize that unless we can equip our young people to be flexible, to recognize the opportunity to take risks and to support that risk taking, that these are the things that will allow us not just to respond to the climate change and the issues there and to solve some of those problems, but to truly build resilience and to, to generate intergenerational wealth, which I think is one of the very key things that we need to ensure that small countries like Barbados, countries in Africa, countries in the Pacific, that we're able to build wealth and to improve the lives. We have some people here we classify as interveners. And Chelsea Brathwick Boyce is a trade researcher at the Sridhar Ramphal Center for International Trade Law. She is one of our interveners. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. And protocols already having been established, a pleasant good night to our esteemed panel. My intervention tonight will take the form of a question. There are several untapped opportunities for the region as it relates to cross-border e-commerce. However, to fully unlock the developmental potential that e-commerce holds, the region needs to build out its digital ecosystem. Areas of concern include digital payment systems, infrastructure, and legislation, among others. My first question then is what scope of cooperation exists between the Caribbean and Africa to collaborate on some of these challenges? And what role can UNCTAD meaningfully play to encourage this type of practical engagement among the South? Secondly, how can trade negotiations be meaningfully leveraged in this regard? Thank you. So, Dr. Jiroji, I suppose you could take this whole question of the scope for cooperation between the Caribbean and Africa when it relates or as it relates to e-commerce and the digital ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, before taking the, answering the question, I, I want to remark that uh, the concerns that were expressed by the speakers before are pretty much what you'd hear if you are talking to a group of uh, youth in Kenya, Africa, anywhere. So those concerns are pretty much the same. They want opportunities. And uh, it's our responsibility as policymakers to create those opportunities, as Minister, you so eloquently said. But in terms of uh, learning, it is absolutely true what was mentioned a moment ago. We need to create ecosystems um, that actually provide not just financing, but also in our view, we call it financing plus. So it's financing, but it's also, uh, let's say, demonstrating or you know, supporting, providing more skills, et cetera. And not only um, in the learning space, but also other things that are supportive, like insurance, et cetera. Now, in the delegation that uh, came to, um, to Barbados, as a matter of fact, uh, we were doing exactly that. Um, in a sense, talking to uh, the counterparts in Barbados, the business community, and for them to see what we have done, our successes in uh, Kenya, and also ourselves learning from it. Now, it's interesting that we brought along two uh, representatives of fintechs. And frankly, uh, you wouldn't, uh, they, they're 
very young as well. So they actually have succeeded in terms of putting forward, um, let's say, specific products that are world class. So in effect, minister, they followed your path. You know, they've not only succeeded, but uh, actually become world class. And that's why they're, they're putting forward their products, which will be beneficial in this space. Thank you. So there's a lot of learning that we need to do, and uh, we, it has to be both ways. We, we have another intervener that you need to hear from. He is Alpha Senon, founder and executive director of an organization called Y Farm. Thank you very much, Mr. David Ellis. Senon Agriculture has been identified as one of the major opportunities for job creation among youth and economic development in the Caribbean. How do we create a more enabling environment for youth across the region to thrive and survive via agriculture and agribusiness where land tenure is concerned, where capital investment and seed startup is still a problem? And also, how do we remove these trade barriers within the region that agripreneurs can trade throughout the Caribbean? Thank you very much. Prime Minister Motley, do you want to take that? Thank you very much. I think that w that is exactly what we're trying to do here. Make available land, make available capital, make available training, because unless we have those three combined with the greater use of technology, we're not going to see more young people get involved in agriculture. And today I made the point, this isn't just about food security, it's about nutrition security. So we really do need to infuse a high degree of training as well. Um, in our own case here in Barbados, we've started the feed program, which is, and, and I keep making the point, in order for us to see change, we need scale. So that the feed program is targeting over 1,200 farmers. Um, some, and these are people, some of whom had never been into farming before. We're also trying to provide access to water and have spent millions of dollars across the country now looking to build um, a catchment areas for water that the farmers can draw from. We're about to launch the, la the, the Lears Land Lease Allotment Program for 165 farmers from as small as um, 5,000 square feet to as large as two acres. And we're doing these things in the context of Barbados that really doesn't have the vastness of a Guyana or a Suriname or a Trinidad or a Belize. So imagine how much more you can do in those countries where you have the capacity for industrial production. In those larger areas, you may have to use and be creative and use financial models and instruments, um, whether it is special purpose vehicles, whether it is cooperatives, whatever it is, in order to get as many young people who typically do not have access to land naturally, nor capital, and who would gravitate to the training, but without those things can't make it. So we see, and President Ali has been charged with the responsibility of trying to reduce our food import bill by 25%, technically by 2025. But we've all said, look, that's, that was before COVID and that was before the disruption of trade. And we're gonna need to be able to advance those um, in a far greater way. So I'm hopeful that between them and then the Caribbean private sector organization, that has literally stepped up to the plate with us to look at areas of production from poultry to different vegetables to see how we can expand production. But we don't only want it at the level of big companies. We need young people to participate. And that's why the government's intermediary role in bridging the gap to the land and to the water and to the technology is so critical to help these young people now. It's a very much a work in progress. Madam Durand, there was a comment that you wanted to make yes. earlier. I think that that's a link between the two conversations uh, on technology and on uh, uh, agriculture. And I think that for the, I don't know exactly what is happening here and I, I was listening what you said, but I feel that uh, it's a, a job, a possibility, an opportunity for young people not only to be a traditional farmer, but I think that the way to develop new agriculture of course, for food sovereignty or nutrition sovereignty, but also regarding technology. Technology could help a lot in order to increase or to improve 
quality of food, organic food, and not, not only the agro-business traditional. And I think that really that's an opportunity for young people to develop this new model of agriculture. I hope that it will work because, it, of course, it requires land and, and access to finance. But I think that it's really something which could, be, could really link technology, food security or nutrition security, but also climate, because of course the way to, to cultivate and the way to develop agriculture is also a way to contribute to save the planet. Uh, so I think that it's a very nice future for young people if we give them the, the opportunities to succeed. Before we came on air, uh, Dr. Giroge asked me how long I was in the business that I'm in. When I told him, he was a bit shocked. But I've been around long enough to tell you, I've heard all of this talk already in this region. And we have not been able to produce the results. And there are many other people in the region who would feel that way. Uh, there was a time when we were talking about specializing and that one country was going to be the bread basket of the region. So those people will sit and shake their heads and say, well, more talk, what's gonna happen? How do we move this? Do we have the political will to do it today to a greater degree than when William Damas was saying it as president of the Caribbean Development Bank? I believe so. And, and, and it's ironic that you call his name because up to yesterday, I, I reminded persons that he was responsible for my first public engagement in a public policy forum at 16, not as a participant, but as somebody who came to watch and learn. And um, we've put our money where our mouth is. Ryan will tell you that we've literally provided funds to be able to provide the water catchment areas, recognizing that without water, there can be no serious farming. We've put the money behind the feed program. I know in Guyana, they're going in a major way after the expansion of corn and soya. I actually think that we are on the right track this time. And that's why, you know, I keep saying that I'm a Jimmy Cliff girl. We can get it if we really want, but we must try and try and try. We'll succeed at last. I believe that the moment has come when people recognize, just as they did during World War II, when we had to grow our own food, that there is a serious, serious problem with transport. And if, for example, we had it with natural gas here the other day, the country was almost in trouble a couple of weeks ago because of a delayed natural gas shipment. If we don't start growing more of our own food, do not be surprised if the world in which we live will, one day, you may not have the ships coming in with the regularity that you would want, and if they don't come with that regularity, then you're going to have problems feeding your own people. This is one of the reasons why we offered to host UNCTAD, to be able to make the case that small island states have the need to protect their farmers and the production of food if they're going to have the kind of nutrition security and food security that we need in order to make sure that we're not dependent only on the external world. But the way how things were, once you were WTO was formed, you had all the non-tariff barriers were effectively removed and you had to drop duties and therefore it attacked and affected domestic production. At the same time, while small countries haven't been able to, to mount the arguments to protect their local production, the largest countries in the world continue with the greatest subsidies in agriculture. So that, that is the disparity that we're fighting up against. And I think that this crop of Caribbean leaders recognize that you're really talking chalk if you're not making sure that you're producing food for people to eat. So let's come now to the, the African experience and Kenya and other African states. What are you seeing at that end? Um, first, I think I need to underscore something that's just been said. Um, it's true. Now there is clarity about what the problems are. But I think also um, we, we have seen in the past so in your 50 years or however many years you've been in this business, uh, we've seen that there has been moments when things have changed dramatically. I'll give you two examples. First, in terms of uh, renewable energy. Uh, in 2010, Kenya had something like 60, 65% of its energy um, was coming from, was renewable, renewable energy. Today, it is 95%. 
So it's gone from two thirds to 95%. Sure, we, we look at Barbados, for instance, and Barbados is about 5%. That's all there is in terms of uh, solar energy. But you can actually say that uh, if Kenya could do it, moving from two thirds to 90%, 95% in you know, 12 short years, um, there is potential for others. So there's a, long, there's a strong element of, uh, let's say, demonstration. Um, now, I know that may not apply to agriculture directly, but I think there is something there. There's also another thing that has happened, which I think is also sig significant. Um, think about what has happened to our financial inclusion. Financial inclusion in 20, uh, 2006, 20, 2007, uh, was at 26 percent. Uh, 26 percent of our population, adult population, were included in the financial sector. That's very low, just a quarter. Today, it is close to 90 percent. So I think there has been, and this is obviously with the power of technology, with the MPESA, with the ecosystem that we are talking about. So I think in agriculture as well, there's a lot of technology that is going there. I remember talking to a young man, actually pretty much one of the ones that I think the minister is talking about, who out of college, he created this, he's an agronomist, and he created this orange, this uh, uh, tomato that is harder to, you know, has a very tough skin. And that makes it more portable, so it can be transported um, much longer distances without bruising it. So you reduce the losses dramatically. My point is that actually it is being done, you know, let's say step by step, or it's being built brick by brick, and we have to be patient with it. And we, it's our job to provide the resources, as the Prime Minister mentioned, to make sure that this really works. Well, as we come to the close, each of you as panelists is being asked to speak for just 30 seconds in wrapping up and giving your summary of what you believe has come out of this uh, UNCTAD 15 and what else you want to see, one or the other. Thanks very much. The, I think the will to push forward is definitely there. And as the, the, the governor has indicated, we've already started with respect to the implementation of plans and therefore over the coming weeks and months, I think young people across the region and globally can expect to see meaningful change, but it is up to us to ensure that we continue to work and make sure that, to ensure, sorry, that financing, the training, the access to technology, as well as the, the protection of the most vulnerable, that once we keep those at the top of mind, then I'm confident that we'll be able to see success coming out of this conference. Four more minutes and um, yes, uh, for Madame um, Durand. For UNCTAD, yeah. we have uh, in three years, it will be the 60th anniversary of UNCTAD, we have three years to show in different issues the progress that we can make. And I'm sure that we will because that's the momentum uh, to, to move and Okay, we will have, we, I give you rendezvous in three years to look what was done and what UNCTAD contributed to do with the SITS, uh, with also all the developing countries, in order to hear the voice, not only the voice, but also the interest and the change in the voice of the developing countries. That's you, what we would like to do. You've given a timetable about three years, you said? Yes, three years, 2024. Okay, and we'll hold, that, hold you to that. So uh, that's that's uh, close the rendezvous. So we will, uh, but I think that in three years we will do the different things. And I count on Madame Motley to follow us if we forget sometimes to do the things. I'm sure that she will not let, let us alone or quiet if we are not enough reactive. So uh, I think that the courage and the energy of those country will also be contagious um, in Umtat. Dr. Jiroge. Thank you. Um, I think all of us eat coconuts, and uh, we've never planted coconuts. I don't think there are too many of us that have planted coconuts. But I think what we have to say here is that uh, we need to plant coconuts that we ourselves will probably not eat from, 
but other generations, those that are coming after us, the youth, etc., will eat from that. And that is when our societies are, their be are at their best. So let's plant those coconuts. <laughs> On the Lac Léman, on the lake, we can try to, to plant uh, Thank you. Cocoa. coconuts. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> the final word is yours, Prime Minister Motley. Thank you very simply that if not, no, when? And if not, us, who? And I think that's what the governor was saying just now, that we have a responsibility, particularly given the nature of the crises, to build for future generations. And we will only do that with the diverse populations and civilizations of the world if there is give and take. There has to be compromise if the distance is going to be sustainable. Clearly, there is a fervent desire for us to move from inequality and vulnerability to potential for all. Join us on December 2nd for our next Caribbean Economic Forum when we'll be looking at promoting regional growth and development. Good night. Thank you.